Okay, the clock strikes at eight, so let's begin. Um, I don't know if we should have a test on Thursday or not. That's what I'm planning for, but if, this is a hefty chapter and we haven't presented our solutions to each other yet. So if we don't get through um, a large majority of this section, I'll postpone the exam to, ne to the next week because I don't want to rush you guys. I want you guys to thoroughly learn it. But if you're up to speed, then we might as well take the exam because I do want to go through the entire textbook before the semester is over. Now, losing a whole two weeks means we lost four class periods and I'll take that into account. But um, yeah, uh, glad to see you guys are all safe and sound. I'm wondering where Alexis and Cam are. Hopefully they're not, um, hopefully they were caught in the snow and the ice. But yeah, all right. Who wants to get the chalk first? We're going on uh, chapter two. We're starting on, um, <clears throat> so, Notice that the ones that are indicated PR 18, PR 19, PR 22, those we've already accomplished. So the first problem, the first theorem in chapter two, that's non-trivial is theorem 36, uh, that uh, the base angles of an isosceles triangle are congruent angles. So given an isosceles triangle, which is not an equilateral triangle, an isosceles triangle, is like so. It says, given that you have an isosceles triangle, prove that these base angles are congruent. This is what we're trying to prove. And I may highlight that in yellow. We're trying to prove that this is congruent to this, given the fact that you have an isosceles triangle. Oh, good. Colton, you ready? Yeah, I'm, ready. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna channel my Tom Brady here. All right, channel the Tom Brady, not the Mahomes. Mah What's his Patrick name? Mahomes. Mahomes. Yeah, Tom Brady. Here we go. Woo! Ah, that's better. <laughs> last time I I mean the last few times I I threw some pretty bad throws to Colton. That was my fault. You got you got to admit it when you mess up. You just got to admit it, admit it, and move on. Lick your wounds and move on. Yes, you may erase what's on the board. You may erase what's on the board. That is legal. Furthermore, you may utilize a compass if you so desire. 
You don't have to, but you can if you want. It does make the proofs really beautiful, though. So. <clears throat> I like that. He is exemplifying how you can pull this off with the compass on the board. There we go. Aha! By definition of isosceles, that is an assumption we can make. Case A looks like a two. Yeah. Don't worry about it. I, I just inferred. <laughs> so, saying that there's a midpoint. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And we all know how you can construct said midpoint, correct? Yeah. Using those two circles, right? A circle of radius BA centered at B and a circle of radius CA centered at C where they intersect. <clears throat> Draw a perpendicular bisector that goes through that point M. That's how you can find it. Now we can start. Uh, nice to see you. Glad you survived the winter. Oh, did I? That seems like it. No, my bad. And then I'm saying we can start the bisector. No! <laughs> Say bye. Side, side, side access to that. Uh, oh, yeah. These two triangles are the same. Triangles A, B, and Zero is triangle A, B.
Wow. That's really cool. They share AM in common. By definition, BM and MC have the same length by definition of midpoint and bisector. So bam, 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 they have three sides in common. So we can say, ah, they're congruent. Beautiful. The base angles being equivalent is just a consequence of the triangles being overall congruent. I really like that. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Excellent proof. All right. Does anybody agree or disagree? Yeah, I was totally revealing that I agreed. It's hard not to agree to, to that when, when it was constructed so thoroughly. Good job, Colton. All right. Theorem 37, congruent angles have congruent supplements. It's the next page, the next theorem. You flip the page to page 20, theorem 37. Congruent angles have congruent supplements. I thought we were, okay, so on the homework, when we turn this in, are we just proving the problems or are we proving all the theorems too? Oh, we're proving all the theorems. Because in the past, we didn't do that. On the, like when we presented our problems, we didn't do the theorems, we just presented like the, the problem, right? Oh, I, I see. I see maybe why you're confused. Oh, no, we're going to be proving every single theorem. Well, that's what I expect out of you is for you to prove every single theorem. So we're saying theorems 29 through 35. We already did. Those in the previous section, yeah. That's why we're skipping those, yeah. yeah. That's what I thought. Right, right. See homework. That works. Yeah. Does that, does that make sense, Caleb? Yeah. Okay. My apologies if I injected any confusion about all that. Yeah. Uh, if we don't um, prove these theorems, then geometry will not make sense. This book is called <clears throat> A Guided Inquiry Approach. I'm your guide, and these theorems are the inquiries, you know? We wonder, are congruent do congruent angles have congruent supplements? There's a theorem next to it. So it's guiding us to that truth. Yes, that's true. What is the explanation? So the fact that there was so much confusion um, about what was expected of you out of the section um, makes me want to postpone the exam for sure to next week. But um, don't expect me to be this lenient forever. The semester just started technically, even though those two weeks we lost. So I'm going to, I'm going to show a lot of grace right now. All right. So yes, I'm expecting you guys to be able to prove all the theorems in a rigorous fashion. Now you may fall short. You, you may not be able to prove every single one. And that's why we collaborate in class. Maybe one of your colleagues knows how to do one theorem and they don't know how to do a theorem that you know how to do. So you guys, we, we come together as a, as a community of mathematicians, fledgling mathematicians, but mathematicians nevertheless, and we try to rigorously prove these theorems together, all the while learning and correcting each other and improving each other. This was beautiful by Colton. He definitely proved that using the construction arguments of the prior section. So does anybody in here know how to prove that congruent angles have congruent supplements? Or do you have any guesses? <clears throat> Let me know so I can throw a piece of calcium carbonate at you. Well, if you have that angle, we can work on it together entirely. All right. Um, Good work, Caleb. Let's see. So 
So well, yeah, this is you want another piece of calcium carbonate? No. Nah, so if we have Straight line, and then an array from the straight line, we'll call it Then wouldn't if this is just a straight line, uh huh. And we think about it like trying to find like the angle of the straight line is like, well, 180 degrees. Yes, right? yeah, but not it's supposed to be an eight. Then for any angle that this is right here, this angle is 180 minus lambda. Yes, that's correct. And since those are congruent, and both of these are equal to 180 minus lambda, then you could call this delta and this, I guess you have to show it too, but is that enough to show that they're congruent? It depends on who you are asking. That is definitely a sort of verification, but it depends on who you're asking whether it is good enough or satisfactory or you, you get what I'm saying? I told you guys earlier that an algebraist will want proofs differently than a topologist which will want proofs differently than a, an analyst, which would want proofs differently than a geometer. So this class is a geometry class. So we're going to try and structure our proofs in a, in a way in which would be palatable to a geometer. So to a geometer, they would say, oh, well, that doesn't utilize our fundamental ideas enough. Okay. So you have this situation. Um, you have this angle, let's call this alpha, let's call it, oh, let's call this theta, let's call this alpha, and then you have this other situation, maybe to show them as distinct entities, we'll highlight them in a different color, let's call this theta prime, and call this alpha prime, so we can say, suppose, Theta is congruent to theta prime. We must show, we must show that alpha is also congruent to alpha prime, right? Would you guys agree or disagree? Congru congruent angles have congruent supplements. We, we would have shown that if we can show alpha is congruent to alpha prime. Okay, so by contradiction, let's assume that they're not. Let's assume that they're not congruent. What would that imply? Well, let me put these dots in the way in which you can see them. Okay. Here's our alpha, uh, here's our um, theta. So if we assume that they're not congruent, this is a great time to pull out the Wu log. Without loss of generality, suppose one of the angles is larger than the other. Yeah, alpha, alpha. let's say alpha prime. Because if they're not equivalent, then one has to be bigger than the other. That's the only option, right? And without loss of generality, we'll just pick alpha prime to be the bigger one. We could have picked alpha to be the bigger one. The proof does not depend on which case, all right? So if alpha prime is going to be larger than alpha, then that means it used to be, it used to extend out this much but now it's going to extend out like this much, for example. Let's have it really be exaggerated. <clears throat> right? <clears throat> and, you know, that kind of almost, let's just have it be like that. 
So it used to be here, our hypothesis that they are not congruent has now modified this picture from here to here. <clears throat> we can label these points. Uh, how does your book, oh, your book doesn't label them in any particular fashion. We can call this A, B, C, D. We can call this A in yellow, D in yellow, C in yellow, D in yellow. And you want to know what? Let's put primes because let's not assume difference in color. I mean, because, you know, this is to keep it. <clears throat> to keep it just straight. Notice that our assumption here that this is true, which implies that, ends up causing this to happen. A okay, prime moves down here, B prime is over here, C prime is over here, D prime is over here. <clears throat> Why is this a contradiction? This is a contradiction. It contradicts something in our hypothesis. So we suppose this, but we also supposed uh, alpha and theta are supplementary. Yes, how and why? Let's go back to our book's definition of what does it mean for two uh, angles to be supplementary. Ah, angles A, B, D, it's, it's on page 15, <clears throat> near the middle of the page. Angles A, B, D and angles C, B, D are called supplementary angles. Why? They have to be collinear points. The A, B, C are collinear points. The D is not collinear to all of them, but A, B, and C is collinear. But notice that A prime, B prime, and C prime are no longer collinear. If we assume that alpha prime is strictly greater in angle measure than alpha. So we assumed the contrary. We found a contradiction because it contradicted the hypothesis that they were complementary angles. I mean, supplementary angles. So, oh, I need to put this over here. We're done. Because why? Well, this implies, this was a contradiction that we found. It contradicted the fact that they are, they are supplementary, which implies that indeed alpha is congruent to alpha prime. So congruent angles have congruent supplements. It's exactly what you would expect. It's intuitive. But can we show it like a geometer would show it? Geometers have a different way of seeing things. That right there, you know, using equations, that's more of like an algebraic explanation. We are learning to think like a geometer, which is like unique. You're talking about the same thing, but it's, it's like talking about it in a different language almost. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Have you guys heard of the of the blind, the three blind men? Uh, they're all touching an elephant, but one of them's touching the tail, one of them's grabbing the leg, one of them's touching like the ear or the trunk, and they're all explaining completely different descriptions of what they're touching. But it's all the same thing. It's an elephant. So everything's about perspective. And now this class is about attaining a geometer's perspective. Does this proof make sense? Okay. So in a way, it's like with halos, they're using kind of numbers to show we're going away from the numbers of time. That's right. And we'll go back to numbers and yeah. stuff like that. But as you guys can see, we can actually prove these things with the definitions that are provided. It breaks the fact that A prime, B prime, and C prime were collinear. Here they're collinear, assuming that alpha prime is not congruent to alpha, breaks their collinearity. And we had assumed that they were supplemental, they were supplementary angles. <clears throat> so 
it logically breaks down to assume that alpha is not congruent to alpha prime. Does everybody understand why proof by contradiction works in math? Why? Why does it work? Because if contradiction doesn't work, then then it's uncontradictable. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of yes. I mean that's obviously true, but it's due to the fact that mathematics is boolean. Who here can tell me what boolean means? Yes, true or false. Either or, it's true or false. It's either true or it's false. There's no half true, half false. Um, not in this form, not in the Zermelo, Frankel, axiomatic and set theoretic formalism. There are abstract mathematics that do have stuff like that, but we won't get into that. So basically it's like, I got a piece of chalk. I, I hide the piece of chalk in one of my hands. I'll shuffle it around and you guess, which hand is the piece of chalk in? Huh? <laughs> my right hand okay right. boom it's not right so where must it be there's 100 percent chance boom it has to be in your left hand right that's why proof by contradiction works uh math is either we set it up to either be true all 100 percent or false so if we assume something and it causes something to break down down the line then the opposite of false was true, and that's true. The opposite of false is true. The opposite of false, the opposite of true is false, right? Because you guessed my right hand and it was wrong, but if you said opposite of your right hand, you would have been right, okay? You can use that kind of logic to explain to people why a negative times a negative is a positive. Okay. Anyways, moving on. Let's move on to corollary 38. It defines vertical angles here. AXB, CXD, those are vertical angles. So let's prove that vertical angles are congruent. Who can prove it for me? Oh, here you go. Whoop. Nice catch. Okay. Yes, you can you can erase anything you want. Here's a eraser. Oh, it's an eraser. Yeah, those look like they work better, but they really don't. They fly they fly out of your hand. If you're not careful, they'll fly out of your hand. They're dangerous, I tell you. Um, so, uh, we've got, so this is actually pretty simple. Just that so um, B the angle B X C is congruent to angle uh, C X B because it's the, the same angle. Um, angle B X A is the complement of Entry to angle of B X C. And then angle mm -hmm. uh, C X B complementary to angle uh, C X squats S uh, B. Since they're supplementary to congruent angles, congruent, since uh, 
congruent angles have congruent subcomponents. Those two, two vertical angles must be congruent. So you are utilizing the fact that con congruent, could you say it? Congruent angles have congruent supplements. So you you establish that, that B this angle is equal is congruent to this angle because it's the same angle. Um, and this is the supplement to this angle, and this is the supplement to this angle. Since they're both since they're supplementary to congruent angles, they must be congruent. Wow, that's a really cool proof. That's really clever to say that BXA is congruent to BXC. Or uh, wait, wait, you know, you said BX, BXC is congruent to CXB. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, oh, it's congruent to itself. Mm -hmm. And so congruent angles have congruent supplements. You did the same thing for AXD and DXA. So then that proves that their supplements must be congruent. And their supplements, CXD and BXA, are precisely the vertical angles you were trying to establish a congruence with. That's really clever. That's not how I did it, but that works. That's really cool. I, I love it when I can see a, a different way of doing something. Yeah, that's why this is a corollary of that. Yeah, that's why this is a corollary of that. Uh, the book says that corollaries are further payoffs of proving the theorem. Does that make sense, guys? You could have also, this was a direct proof. You could have also done it through contradiction. You could have assumed uh, angle CXD and angle BXA were not congruent, all right? And that would, that would contradict the fact that uh, B, so you could, it would again contradict the fact that they were, uh, supplementary because they would no longer be collinear. So AXC and BXD are collinear. And if you were to assume that BXA is somehow larger than CXD, then that would make uh, AXC no longer collinear. I could write that out for you or I can, I can publish it online that you guys can see it later. That proof is really cool. It's really cool to just like say BXC, well, that's the same thing as CXB, and then use this fact. It's clever. I like, all right. Now, time for the weak right angle theorem. An angle that is congruent to a right angle is also a right angle. All right. I like weak. Weak proofs, they let me be a little lazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, some weak proofs are very difficult, like the weak proof of the Goldbach con conjecture. That took hundreds of years. And so the Goldbach conjecture is still not solved. How long did, this, how long did the strong proof take? Uh, it hasn't been proved yet. Oh, that makes sense. The, Gold, the Goldbach conjecture states that every even number clearly greater than two. Um, every even number greater than two is the sum of two prime numbers. That is the Goldbach conjecture. It is an unsolved long-standing problem in mathematics. Very interesting. I'm definitely working on it. <laughs> Wasn't there a way to predict primes using the golden ratio? Maybe. So it's like you can use that and you can predict the next prime. Actually, uh, yeah, there's no way to there's no way to predict the next prime. There is no way. There's not that we know of. There's a predict there's a way to predict a prime that's later, but there's no yeah. way to guarantee that's the next. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We do not have an analytical formula that will tell us first comes this prime, then this prime, then this prime. We have no choice but to computationally check arbitrary numbers. Yes, but it's a computational feat. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a ingenious math. Well, there are some ingenious mathematics to going 
into creating an efficient algorithm to be able to determine whether a prime number is prime or not, but still, that's not good enough for us mathematicians. We want to analytically figure out how, what, how can we discover the next prime? And that kind of a discovery would be like earth shattering. It would require a full-blown solution to the Riemann hypothesis, which would land you a million dollars by the Clay Mathematical Institute. It's a millennium prize problem. Why are you the on the internet webs. <laughs> Fairly easy, just because it's based off of one we did like two weeks ago. Uh -huh. Basically, I'm just going to make the two circles and then just draw the perpendicular lines that are all at the same angle. They're all 90 degrees. Okay. And that means they're all 90 because that's where they're all right angles. Okay, let's see it. That seems easy. Let's see it. So it's, uh, as before, it's two circles with radius AB. In the future, I'll, I'll set up like very near future. I can set up like a, like an Elmo. And you guys could come up here and like do it on a paper and it will come up on the board. Maybe that'd be easier than using chalk compass. No, no, I just suck at using these. That's just in general. Yeah, I'm, I, well, what I mean is it's, it's easier to use a pencil compass or a pen compass. It's a lot easier and faster. Both of you to assume I can't mess that up as well. <laughs> I would say your handwriting is improving. <laughs> so I have I have a lot of faith in the ability for human beings to grow. The harder we try, the faster we'll grow. Okay, so you created a perpendicular bisector of AB. The weak right angle theorem states that an angle that is congruent to a right angle is also a right angle. All right. What is the definition of a right angle? Don't use the 90 degree uh, argument. Uh, it's perpendicular. Don't use the perpendicular argument. What? Yeah, I know. That's the whole point. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. But th th this is what's cool is you take, take a look at the definition. Let's take a look at the definition of a right angle. A right angle is an angle that is congruent to one of its supplements. Okay, it is. Yes. <laughs> yes. If you have a right angle, it's congruent to, you know, both its supplements. Every angle has two supplements, right? Every angle has two possible supplements. So, by definition of a right angle. So, yeah, I mean, you, you definitely has, have constructed a right angle. Um, so here, here's my take on it. Uh, I said, okay, an angle that is congruent to a right angle is also a right angle. So we create exact same situation like you. Uh, this is, let's call this alpha, let's call this uh, theta, okay? Let's say this is A, B, C, D, and X over here, <clears throat> all right? An angle that is congruent to a right angle is also a right angle. So let's assume theta, let's not just outright state that it's a right angle even though it's definitely is. But let's say that theta is this angle that's congruent to a right angle. How does it being congruent to a right angle imply it is a right angle off of how the, a geometer would say it? Well, because if, it, if a right angle is congruent to a supplement, 
then it's congruent to that right angle. There you go. That's it. Since alpha is a right angle and alpha is congruent to its supplement. That implies theta is, is a right angle. Because if this is congruent to that, then we could have started the whole thing by saying theta is congruent to one of its supplements. And the fact that that supplement is congruent with it it seems like a circular argument, but it that is how you can satisfy their book definition of a right angle. That is a right angle, and so is this one. But you know, we, in mathematics, we have to learn how how to play within the rules, if if that makes sense. So, like in group theory, you have to play within the rules of additive or uh, inverse elements and closure and identity elements and and whatnot. And in geometry and in all math, you gotta have to play within the rules of their definition. So this is how you can satisfy that definition. That's how you can construct a right angle. They're subtly different. They're subtly. Okay, moving on. There's axiom four angle non congruence. Very interesting, very intuitive. No. Okay. Although we we are actually yes, not this one, but notice if you flip the page, theorem forty four, eight, theorem theorem forty five. Yeah, those are those those were what you would have thought of as axioms, but now we're going to prove them. If you prove something, it's no longer an axiom. Axioms are uh, something that you just take as given in the mathematical framework. It's something that you you really believe intuitively should hold. It's like one plus one should equal two. You can even call that an axiom. It's a not a very interesting or overarching axiom, but it is one. All right, then the traversal, the definition of a traversal, the definition of corresponding angles and alternate interior angles. Now we move on to the weak alternate interior angle theorem. If two lines have a traversal which forms alternate interior angles that are congruent, then the two lines are parallel. Who wants to show us how you can do that? So pi picturesquely, like in figure 2.3, it's saying if the circle angle and the star angle are congruent, that means M and N must be parallel. Who could show us this proof? And they're, oh, look, very, a very rare hint by this author. This author is very, 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 very stingy on their hints. But they've given us a, a rare hint over here. A strategy to prove this theorem would be to suppose that two lines do intersect at some point, forming a triangle with the traversal. Find the congruent triangle on the other side of the traversal that forms a pair of angles violating axiom four. Has anybody in here worked on this and knows how to show this? Or they believe they, they might have a hunch on how to get there? Or maybe has a wild idea that might work? Maybe, 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 maybe not.
So here's what we're trying to prove. So weak alternate interior angle theorem. So I don't have to write it out. You guys have it in front of you. If two lines have a traversal, which forms an alternate interior angle in which those said alternate interior angles are congruent, that implies the lines are parallel. So let's just suppose everything and let's prove this by contradiction. Let's suppose everything that the two lines have a traversal, they form alternate interior angles that are congruent, but then let's assume that the lines are not parallel. So by setting up contradiction, assume M and N are not parallel. What does this imply? What happens to non-parallel lines? Because they're infinite, they extend up. They intersect. Yes. So that implies they intersect. So let P be the point, point in which they intersect that. So let's draw a schematic. So here's, <clears throat> okay, let's move it. Okay, so yeah, right here's fine. Here's our line L, and here's M, N. And here's the point where they intersect that we're talking about P. All right. Now let's talk about the alternate interior angles that are congruent. We suppose that these alternate interior angles here are congruent. So therefore I will note, I will, therefore I will give them the same symbol, theta and theta. They don't look the same, do they? Yeah, that's on purpose. They're not, and we have to show that they're not. Notice that if we drew the perfect scenario of what the theorem is trying to show, this would be M, this would be N, and here's L. Oh, oh, and the alternate interior angle would be theta here, and theta here, and clearly that's true. Those are congruent, which we're trying to show that M and N are parallel. So we're, we, sh we show that they're, they must be parallel by assuming the contrary and finding a contradiction. So we assume that they're not parallel. Okay, so if they're not parallel, but yet they have congruent alternate interior angles, theta is clearly congruent to theta. That's why I write that, okay? Now what? Well, we, we could then um, denote a supplement. Maybe let's call this uh, alpha and call this alpha, right? Let alpha be the supplement to theta. Why did I call both of those alpha? Because they're inverse, because they're congruent to supplement, they're the supplements of different angles. Yes, because congruent angles have congruent supplements. Boom, so we may assume that Yellow alpha and yellow alpha are congruent. Clearly they're not. And that's what we're gonna use. We're gonna use the fact that they're not to show the contradiction. We can't just say, well, look, they're not. No, we need, we need, we need to make our argument more refined. Our argument needs to be very precise as to like why. You can't just be like, come on, look at it. Because I uh, have ASA. ASA. Um, yeah. With the, the transversal, the, the segment of the transversal between the two lines being the same segment. This? Yeah. Yes. So that's congruent to itself. Theta is congruent to theta. Alpha is congruent to alpha. That means we should have congruent triangles. Where's the other is, triangle? But one of them is not even a triangle. Right. So that, that should mean that, that this. 
is a congruent triangle to this. <laughs> but this isn't even a triangle. <laughs> Yeah, which, which makes it hard. To be yeah, clear. yeah, that, that's that's what's happening. So that's exactly what's happening. But what, what you could do is utilizing your compass. You can grab your compass. You can do a isometry, can't you? We can do basic isometries. We can use our ruler and our compass and we can pull off a basic isometry. So I'm going to do the hint that the book is talking about. It says uh, a strategy to prove this theorem would be to suppose that two lines do intersect at some point, call it capital P, forming a triangle with the transversal. <clears throat> Find a congruent triangle on the other side of the transversal. That's what we're going to do with the basic isometry. We're going to take a copy of this triangle and flip it over here like so. And we're going to call this a P prime. And I'm going to reproduce it over here. Uh, Finding a congruent triangle on, on the other side of the transversal that forms a pair of angles violating axiom four. And that is when we will have rigorously shown it. This is definitely, definitely uh, barking up the right tree. So uh, what do we call this N? We call this M, we call this capital P. Uh, and then there's a line L. And so maybe in a different color, uh, red, we'll show the reflection or yeah. Reflect this triangle here in which it had, I didn't label these points, but these can all be points here. Okay, let's see, how do I label them? I call it A, B, this was A, this was B, um, this was a C, extend this out here, extend this out here. So this is a, a there's gonna be some labeling here. It's gonna take a little bit, A, B, here's a C, here's a P, here's a P prime, over here is a D, is that all of them? I don't know, we call this a E, call this an F. Much of this is unnecessary, but it just, just goes to show you that you can you can do that, okay? So here's our reflection here. And let's relabel this theta, alternate interior angle. This whole thing, remember, was supposed to be a theta. The whole thing was supposed to be a theta. So the little thing will be, this little thing will be our theta prime. And this whole thing used to be alpha. All right. So this whole thing is alpha. So we're going to call this little one alpha prime. Clearly something messed up is going on. As you guys are all noticing, hey, there's something messed up going on. But how can we prove it? We're going to prove it using axiom four. Who can? Oh, I, yeah. So axiom four, everybody sees it on their book, right? Yeah, I don't have to redraw everything. It says that that small angle AXB can never be congruent to the large angle AXC if B is an interior point. B would have to not be an interior point for that congruence. To, to hold, but if B is an interior point, there's no way that AXB will be congruent to the larger angle AXC. We're gonna use this to our advantage. We have created a congruent triangle here. Triangle uh, PAB 
is congruent by isometry to P prime A B. ASA, ASA also gives it to you as well. ASA can give it to you, a basic isometry can give it to you, okay? Now what? We're gonna set up a contradiction here. So suppose my means of contradiction, M and N are not parallel. They intersect us at some point P. Then we may use a compass and generate the reflection. So we have these congruent triangles. So we notice that P prime is a point on the interior of angle CAB. CAB. You guys see that? P is a point that's on the interior of CAB. Okay, but notice that the corresponding by CP, C, P, C, F, C, corresponding parts of congruent figures are congruent. C, A, B was our theta, was it not? Right, it signifies this theta, but corresponding Parts of congruent figures must be congruent. So that means this angle PBA should be the same thing. This should equal angle PBA, right? Contradiction. That is a violation of axiom number four. And here's why. Over here in this theta, P prime, which is the which is the corresponding part of the congruent figure to P, is an interior point for the angle theta. But over here, capital P is not an interior point for the corresponding part of the figure theta here it is actually part of the angle. It is not an interior point. So the fact that they're the same means that they're congruent. And that violates axiom number four, because it says that there's no way that angle AXB and angle AXC can be congruent. But here we've established that a corresponding part of a congruent figure has an analogous interior point being congruent to the whole angle, the whole angle theta here versus the angle theta over here. So it contradicts axiom number four. You can see that because you know theta prime is clearly smaller than what theta is in this picture. That's why I wrote the theta and the alpha prime respectively because this is what's messing up. This is so as you guys said, uh, as Cameron noted that this should be a triangle, but it's not. Well. It's not, let's force it to be a triangle and show exactly what is it messing up. It's messing up axiom number four. So on your homework and on your tests and on your proofs, that is, that is the rigorous way of showing stuff. Just drawing it and saying clearly, look at the picture. There, uh, you know, the theorem, the theorem follows from the picture. That is not enough. That'll get you some points because I reward every student for trying. If you leave something blank, I give no points. But if you give an attempt, I give I give a significant amount of points. Sometimes like 50%. So 
anyone who's taken me before knows that. I value uh, effort. I think people, I think students should be rewarded for putting in an effort. It should be rewarded because really trying is much better than not trying. And if you get rewarded for trying, you'll do it again. You do it again, and you'll do it again, and you will be successful if you continue to try and never give up. So that is the weak alternate interior angle theorem. Who could show us the corollary 41? Two lines have a transversal, which forms corresponding angles that are congruent. Then the two lines are parallel. So this proof had to do with alternate interior angles being course congruent. This next proof, this corollary has to do with the corresponding angles. Recall that these are alternate alternate interior angles, and these are corresponding angles for a transversal L. So now this theorem is saying, oh, if the corresponding angles are congruent, then yeah, you also get that M and N are parallel. So you can have the alternate interior angles being congruent or the corresponding angles being congruent. If that's ever the case, then you have some parallel lines. I'll, I will leave the corollary for, for later. Uh, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll give you guys some time to absorb this. Were you guys not aware we were going to prove the theorems? Oh, OK. OK, well, yeah. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, yeah. Yeah, when, when we did this, I think it was like the last time we were in class, we worked on this section. Mm -hmm. And I think we just did 55, 6, 57. Did anybody else? Did y'all do that too? Okay. You guys just did the problems? Yeah, I thought. I thought I was going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, we're going to prove theorems too. As many as we can, given, given our time constraint. All right. So the corollary, uh, I'm going to save that for later. I'm going to let you guys uh, digest it, and we'll see if you can come up with the proof for the corollary on Thursday. Let's, moving, let's move on to the weak parallel line corollary. Given a line L and a point P not on L, there is a line M such that P is on M and M is parallel to L. So this is an existence proof. Kind of. Yes. It was a perpendicular. No, no. Uh, yeah, we've done this before. Yeah, problem 28. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this is saying prove the existence of that line M. And if you construct it, you've, you've proven this existence. Yeah. So, yeah, this one, this one's a lot. I mean, if I had my projector, it'd be easier. But this one requires um, a lot of compass maneuvering. So, so that's the construction right there. A lot of compass maneuvering there. I'll up, I'll upload this stuff and Thursday you guys will do it too. So you could do it, and I'll I'll bring that projector so that you guys can use your compass. And it's really hard to use these chalkboard compasses. It just is. It's more time consuming than just doing it by a pencil compass. Okay. So because we were able to construct it, P was an arbitrary, P is an arbitrary point, okay? L is an arbitrary line. Because we were able to construct this in an arbitrary situation, we've shown that M exists. This line that goes through the point P that is not on the line L, it exists because we were able to construct it. Okay, 
that's sufficient. If you were able to construct it, then that's a sufficient proof. Okay, now let's move on to the weak exterior angle theorem. It defines an exterior angle of a triangle and the opposite interior angles to an exterior angle. <clears throat> BCD is an exterior angle and the opposite interior angles is angle B and angle A in that triangle in figure 2.4. So can we prove that an exterior angle of a triangle is not congruent to either opposite interior angle? BCD was congruent to BAB, uh, that would mean that uh, BC and BA were parallel because uh, they'd be uh, corresponding angles. That's right. That's right. Which does what? And since corresponding angles are uh, corresponding angles are uh, congruent on when we have two parallel lines uh, with a transversal. Yes, but that's impossible. Right. It's impossible for those two lines to be parallel, or else you wouldn't have, you won't make a triangle. Right. So there so you go. Contradiction. Mm -hmm. Proved it. So you proved it by contradiction. You assumed that. Uh, uh, you said uh, BCD and BAD were congruent. You showed that that would imply that the line L that traverses M and N would force that N and M would be parallel, which is a contradiction. M and N are not parallel. They intersect. Matter of fact, that they, they intersect at two at, at, at the point A. <clears throat> okay. Now, what about uh, the angle ABC compared to BCD? So if ABC and BCD were congruent, that would mean that AB and AB would have to be parallel because uh, then BC would be the transversal and they'd be. Uh, alternate interior angles. Correct. Again, that's impossible. You wouldn't form a triangle utilizing parallel lines there. So make sure that you make your arguments um, thorough and rigorous whenever you're proving these. And make sure to always call yourself out. Every time I write something, one sentence in mathematics, you have to call yourself out. You have to be like, is this right? Can this be wrong? Yeah, I know. You know, sometimes we wish that we were just filled with confidence and we just do everything willy nilly. Mathematics is not like that. As confident as you are, if your statements don't make any logical sense or there's no proof for the validity of your statements, you have to reconsider them. So make sure to reconsider your statements and whenever, you're, whenever um, we collaborate in class together, present your ideas that you've thought through very, very thoroughly and then we'll think through your ideas very, very thoroughly together and we will learn together. Okay, so now we move on to theorem 44, ASA. It says that, okay, SSS and SAS are axioms. We're not gonna prove those, but ASA, that's theorem 44. Can we prove it? I provided a proof for the for this in that first section that this stuff came up in. Yeah. But 
there might be a different way of proving it more along the lines of what this section is talking about. And it'd be interesting if one of you guys could come up with that. Hmm. Would you like to we have about six minutes. Would you like to? Take a stab at it during that time. So we, we just proved the. So given an angle, a side and an angle of a triangle. The angle side and angle is congruent to another triangle's angle side and an angle. Where the side is between those two angles. How can we? rigorously show that those two triangles must be congruent. All the while knowing that SAS and SSS um, can, can be utilized as axioms. Did something like go for it. Um, go for it. So if we did something like this, um, where we have. Where we say that this is theta and this is theta, and this is alpha, and this is uh, alpha. So, so this is our angle psi angle. Might as well just draw the triangle out, right? Yeah. Just well, just we're, complete we're that. To, yeah. So what I'm thinking is this line should be parallel to this line. I'm trying to figure out how to get there. Oh, that's cool. You could get there, like you said, with the alternating interior angle. Mm -hmm. If the alternating interior angle of a traversal shows that the so if you have a traversal which is the base of your triangle mm -hmm. um if alternating interior angles of that traversal are congruent that implies that the traversal is traversing two parallel lines yeah we just we haven't proved that yet we proved the the inverse that if oh no we, we have proved this part never mm -hmm. mind Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can extend that line out yeah. for the base of the triangle. Mm -hmm. You can extend that line out, and that becomes your traversal line. Yeah, this is our traversal, mm -hmm. and then these are parallel lines. And then by the same logic, these lines should be parallel. Because what? Alternate because interior angle, same logic, yeah. Hmm. So, it's okay. So what does that do? So if we want to bank on SAS, we have to find one of the side lengths to be correspond to be congruent. One of the corresponding side lengths needs to be congruent. 
And then we could use SAS and show that the two triangles are congruent triangles. That may not be the only route at achieving that, but Isn't that cool how those uh, theorems just like, once you've proven them, they just kind of like make geometry more, it was already intuitive, you know, parallel lines. That's a very intuitive concept. You know, people who know nothing of geometry can drive within a lane, right? Because human beings have an intuitive understanding of what straight lines are like and what curved lines are like. But when you make them axiomatic and rigorous, and formulaic, you, you then see that, oh, that's why parallel lines are parallel. This is because if you form a traversal, their alternate interior angles are, course, are, are congruent. Also, their corresponding angles are congruent. Because this line is parallel to this line, uh, no. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, I, I don't think we're as a class ready for the exam yet especially after realizing that you guys are expected to know how to do the theorems. <laughs> no wonder you guys thought this was a blow off class. It is not a blow off class, guys. <laughs> it's a fun class. It's gonna be fun, it's gonna be challenging, but it's not a blow off class. I wanna actually you know, challenge us in here. I think hard stuff is fun. The harder it is, the, the more fun it is. That's why solving the Riemann hypothesis would probably like be so fun that I might die if I ever did it. <laughs> I'll die and I'll leave the million dollar inheritance to you guys. One homework. Um, oh, thanks. Okay. So this person, they answered three more questions than they needed to. I don't know if that was Okay. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why they did that, but yeah. They did it, so <laughs> more power to them. Yeah. Um, and then everybody else answered questions instead. These two. They like wrote down, but they misled the last two. I think 33 and 34. Okay. All right. I don't know. I don't know what to do about that either. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm making their homework uh, completion. So uh -huh. yeah, if you can give them feedback. I mean, I also, the solutions I give you are the solutions I give them as well, mm -hmm. so. I just put like, we're missing like those two. That's right, know. yeah, that's fine, that works. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I know it might be less time consuming than you thought it would be. Oh, yeah. So feel free to act like it took more time than it really did to get some extra dollars. Oh, wait, oh, I'm just kidding. Let me stop the recording before I say something like that. <laughs>